<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Canlis Wine Drinking 101. My name's Nelson. And I have with me uh, one of Seattle's most talented sommeliers, Erica Katubig. She's one of our sommeliers, one of our servers, someone that's been here for almost three years now. Four, Four three, years. Three something. Three. But somebody that I remember uh, seeing around at wine tastings in, throughout the city. Um, so you were at, with Tom Douglas at the time, and then uh, I remember you dining here with, with Gabe for dinner. And when we started to expand what our team was gonna look like, um, I asked the rest of the people on the wine team, like who would we want to be a part of it? And your name was at the top of the list. And so we actively recruited you, uh, pitched you a few times how to get here, <laughs> to get here. And um, I'm glad that you did. So welcome. So Fine. happy. Finally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's see, for today we've got six wines, and thank you all for joining us. Um, we put six wines together from Wine Drinking 101 because it's kind of like what we want to drink. Wines from around the world, and then not only this, uh, things that we want to drink, but have some sort of context to how we select wines and what we feel like are important features and sort of like learning from them. So it's pretty cool, we got three whites, three reds. If you're at home and uh, picked up a box here, uh, those wines should have gone in the refrigerator and pulled out 15 minutes ahead of time. So if you haven't done that, uh, keep. we want the reds cool and the whites chilled. Um, we'll go for one wine at a time. And what, what you should do is pour only two thirds of the wine into the glass. So we're not trying to finish everything before we keep going, before we move along. Uh, but we're also not trying to uh, rush you through the process. Our idea of drinking wine and tasting wine throughout the night will be one, we won't spit. No spitting. <laughs> uh, so you should in at home too, but we wanna make sure we get through the end where we're sort of like still in it, give you some good pointers, have an opportunity to really evaluate the wines for quality, and then have fun. At the end of every wine, you'll hear us talk about how much we like it, how much we enjoy it, and then what context we would wanna do it in, whether it's a cocktail party, something to have around the house, dinner, or bites of food that you've gotten with you. So let's let's start with the first wine, and oh yeah yeah yeah, and we've got a cool cat here in the cellar. I wish we had you here every single day. Um, uh, if you were in here, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, just hiding out in the sun, you pop right up. If you were um, here like when we had like inventory every single month, that would yeah be that would be awesome. So nice. <laughs> cool. And thank you, Jason. You got some wine, so we're all set. Um, yeah, why don't we get started? I yeah, think yeah. I think now's the time to do it. We'll start with their first wine. So we'll do Frilano by Olivia Faluga out of Friuli. Uh, and while I'm doing this, Jason, we need some pump up music. I mean, something good so we can dance to just a little bit, please. Basically, is basically spitting. Would you, is that true? Is That's that, true. That a fair statement? That's true. And um, I'd say not just drinking, um, but also like being in good company. You're at home. You're relaxed. Yeah. The environment now is sort of like something you're very familiar with, and you just want to be enjoying the wines. Less pressure on sort of like breaking it down and evaluating. In the end, you want to be able to say, what did I like from this? What didn't I like? Yeah. So it kind of like shapes and guides you throughout buying wine in the future. Uh, and overall sort of that experience of when you're when you're traveling throughout the country or other places have reference points to tell people what you enjoyed about like your wine experience. Yeah. So um, just quickly we're going to go through a set of what wines and how we evaluate them based on the nose, um, secondarily the palate, and then and then lastly we'll do what we think of how much we like the wine as a finish on its finish. So I'm ready to taste, are you? Yes. All right, let's do it. The first wine here is Livio Faluga Furlano. When I put, put a wine in a glass, there's all these rules about like looking at its legs, swirling it, and taking your time with it. I do that pretty quickly. I go through it and I'm just looking for color, for oxidation for one, for white wines, uh, and then making sure that there's nothing else in the glass. A lot of times if I see a darker golden color, that may be attributed to oak, and, and sort of like maybe framing up a bit of an expectation. This here, really quickly, just going through it, nice, clear, a touch of green to it, but a little bit of a brassy note. Okay, on the palette. 
Wait. <laughs> Let's go nose. Let's smell it first before we start slugging wine. Okay. <laughs> oh, help not. That's boring. Watching people smell wine is like the boringest thing to do. This is so exciting. <laughs> My nose is smelling so many things. Well, you know, like what I get is um, I break it down with fruit, earth, and wood. And I think that's a format we'll do. So based on fruit, I get sort of a citrus note. I get grapefruit. I get Le Meyer lemon. I get um, green apples. Uh, and then a little bit of a quince note to it. Mm-hmm. Nelson, is it true? Is it true? I mean, there's a rumor going around that women actually can smell better than men. Yes. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, like, is that true to that rumor? Like, especially pregnant women, there's a heightened sense of smell, but in general. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like women are better tasters uh, in general and even more naturally than men do. So, guys, listen to the women when they're talking about wine and um, cologne. Seriously. <laughs> Erica, Just what do you smell there? They yeah. know. What do I smell? I smell. I love I love those same notes and the yep. quince really comes out for me mm. and I love the brightness this is my first wine of the day and so yeah. it feels like lighter and more airy and yeah I get a little bit of a straw note to it and a little bit of a saltiness yes cool no oak I don't pick up any of that sort of like clove or vanilla um, and I'm ready to drink that that assessment as I'm sort of like doing it in a professional mm. setting takes usually about 20 seconds, shorter even if, not, if um, I'm just like enjoying myself at dinner and I'm ready to taste. That's where you'll find a lot of information. Let's go for it. I think you leave it up. Yeah, dry on the palate, <gasps> medium bodied, mm -hmm. a lot of richness to it. I get sort of like that mouth coating, sort of like waxiness. Mouth coating, yeah. yeah. And then I get a little bit more of the same fruits. I get that grapefruit, that, that sort of like even sweeter orange. Oh, yeah. Um, and then on the back end, a slight like bitterness, maybe that like pithiness from it. Yes. What, what do you get? I get like a mandarin orange pith, you know? Yeah. It's not like quite the rind part, and it's mm. not all of the oil. It's like that like really tender part mm. of it. This is from Luvio Feluga out of Friuli, and the name of the grape here is Frilano. Frilano uh, Friuli is a region in Italy, sort of the northeastern corner of Italy, closer to Slovenia, and about an hour and a half drive from Venice. From there, you'll get that, that sort of like hillside quality fruit where you get exposure to sunshine and sort of that cooler temperature naturally. And here's where you start to see maybe a little bit more of the grape coming out itself, right? Something that's, that's very similar to what Sauvignon Blanc would be like, and even sort of like Pinot Gris. But Frilano is from Friuli, and that's something that I just want to claim for themselves. Yeah. Right, so fifth generation winery out of Friuli in Italy. And like when I think about that, and I think about what I want to eat with it, I, I think this is a starter. I think this is an earlier wine. I think this is a salad wine, an appetizer wine, and I feel like uh, this is a really straightforward, simple, pleasant, easy drinking and then like delicious wine. Oh, yeah, so what about delicious. you? I want to drink like eight ounces of it with a with a bunch of bread because I'm too impatient to wait for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know what? And this is, you want it cool. You want it lively. You want it refreshing. And then as it warms up, you'll have a chance to try this later. You'll start to see it open up. Maybe mm. more aromatics more that start to come out. Maybe a little Maybe deeper, a little... more like salty, more yeah. like rich that like. Yeah. Cool. Okay, Nutty. so that's the first wine. So that's the, us talking about it a little bit. We're gonna go through that as sort of like an exercise of saying like, what else do we get? Fruit, confirm that on the nose, what we picked up on the nose. Any earthiness on the palate, we talked about the saltiness and the brightness. And then I don't get any oak on it because this really won't see any oak, but we talk about texture. The last part of it, because we're drinking at home and this is us evaluating wine as we would as sommeliers, do we like it or not? Yes. What do you say? I like it. Yeah? Yeah. But I think also it's like such a chuggable wine mm. for me. Yeah, for me too. Again, we talked about wine, food wine pairings, things yeah. that we enjoy with it. I really enjoy this wine. We put it as um, part of our lineup to be a great starter to go with appetizers and something that's just outside of the box of what you would normally pick up as Sauvignon Blanc or easy white drink, drinking white wines. Um, don't forget about this place. It's called 
Friuli yeah, and the great beers of Friuli. You in, in picking up white wines from Northern Italy. Yeah, I mean, you can just find some really cool stuff up there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh. Maybe a little less expensive than than what you're going to find, you know, if you're hunting through Burgundy or certainly yeah, yeah, white but, wines from, from California. Yeah, and maybe just, I would say, I would say a level and maybe a, a weight class above Pinot Grigio, where you get tons of flavor, um, dry enough palate, great finish and lively, tons of acidity. So when you're talking weight, we're talking about like the, the, the bigness and the mouthfeel of the wine. One of the things that people love about Chardonnay, maybe it's just worth mentioning, is that sort of big weight, right? And then sometimes right. we, we start dinner off with these less weighty wines, right? They're yeah. like lean and acidic and they're kind of geeky, but sometimes I think I think it's really nice to have something with a little body on it that yeah. isn't necessarily like a big Chardonnay. Oh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, this is Wine Drinking 101, so we're gonna kind of give you some tips and pointers about what we like to do and how we open things up and what, um, there's no other place to start than opening a bottle of wine. So I'm gonna give Erica a wine key. I think I already gave it to you. Magic. <laughs> And um, opening a bottle of wine in a normal bottle of wine, that's pretty, with a capsule, you want to make sure you get a good clean cut on both ends of it. And we've given you a wine key, something like this. Kutal. Um, that's Kutal. This is my favorite wine key. You know, you can have all these other like wine gadgets at home, but there's nothing that replaces a simple <laughs> wine key like that. A hinged wine key, a good corkscrew, um, and a blade. If you look at this blade compared to all the other blades that you have at home or may maybe not, um, they're not as jagged and rigid, so this gives me a cleaner cut along the way. Um, and that's why it's one of my favorites. I want a clean cut on the floor when I'm serving guests because nothing speaks to a sommelier more than just being a professional and having it precise and exact. But what if you don't have, what if you have a wine that has like a, a wax top on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So what if we open a bottle of wine Canlis is with a wax top on it. Well, let's go. Let's see. no. Well, let's see what we have no. here. Any of these will do. Um, and I picked one earlier. Oh God, because I hope we can open it. Um, this is Chablis. This is from one of, one of my favorite producers um, called Thomas Pico, and he does one called Pat Loop. So. <clears throat> And Nelly, a few questions just why, while Erica is, is making quick work of that. Easy yeah. Prefer, I think there might be some food. I think we might have hidden it, actually. What they're eating at home, I think, mm. is underneath. Could you just talk about what the Freelander would actually go with? If you're looking at the same food yes. they're looking at oh. home, like, why does that work? And I like it. I, I love it with cheese to begin with. Right? You want acid that you find in wine to go with something fatty. Um, tannin plays the same sort of role. In this case, cheese is nothing but that rich mouth coating fat as you start to break things out. I think that's always a natural pairing. Have that with some crackers. A little bit of fresh fruit goes a long way. And here with, with almonds or some bar nuts or anything like that, I think that makes a great combination. Something salty uh, and something clean. I'm not eating any real protein or anything, anything meaty at this point. I just want the starter, something light. What about you, Big Cat? Oh, definitely the cheese, but I yeah. always go for cheese first. Yeah, yeah, I mean, every course. Like, first cheese. And then, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about whatever else everyone else is eating. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go, go and open it. this yeah. though. Take a look at this. When Erica's doing this um, bottle of wine and it's a composite here of wax and maybe something just a little harder. Mm -hmm. You wanna make sure, you wanna check it, you wanna check to see if it's pliable or not. But more often than not, yeah, you can just pierce right through the top and drill through it and pull the cork up uh, as you would if the, if the wax wasn't there. And you'll see with this bottle itself, it's sort of chipping the cork away. And here, yeah, when you start to pull it up, at that point, you're pretty safe because you're breaking off all these sort of like shards of, of um, wax that should be on the top yeah. away from the opening. And at this point now, you've got a clean surface and an opening to pour the wine out of. You know, I mentioned about earlier about that sort of cork composite or wax composite, if it's just a little stickier, you have that temptation of like cutting the, the cork don't. or the wax out, stay away from that for now. Try pulling it up through it first. If that doesn't seem to work, um, use, a, use a knife to score just the outside of where the cork would be, and that should help pull the cork right through the wax. Mm -hmm. A lot of comments around, like it's just what, it, you know, it, there's, it, it's tempting to want to cut the wax. Don't. Wax doesn't cut that well. And no. if you're right. at a table with a tablecloth, I have made the mistake 
of just decimating the tablecloth with so many pieces of broken wax. So yeah. I think this is such a cool secret. You just you just go That's straight through it and you pull yeah. straight out and it's just gonna make a clean yeah. clean opening. Oh yeah, Jason, get your glass ready because we got some Chablis. This isn't uh, part of your kit at home, but I'll tell you, it's a special treat for us all here. If you want more than that. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. He's not ready, he's gotta speed up a little bit. Yeah, well, Jason, why up. don't you speed up? Um, this is Wine Drinking 101. <laughs> mm. It was actually really funny, Nelly, is that um, when I first became a sommelier, yeah. my... Oh. Like one of my horror stories, like what's the worst thing that happened to you on the yeah. floor, is me opening up a bottle of wine with, with a with a huge like wax seal, and just chipping away at it. Oh, oh my god, it's so horrifying. It's it. tough, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's embarrassing. Sometimes you just like caught up in that moment of like uh, like uncertainty, and then try to like work your way through it. Um, in the end, um, do what you can to salvage a cork, keep it in one piece, uh, in front of a guest. Uh, have that experience, have that sort of like belief and trust in yourself that you're doing the right mm. thing and then you can make it really make it through pretty quickly. All right, we're going to move on to the next wine. This is Von Buell Riesling. This is the 2016 vintage mm -hmm. out of a reading called The Faults out of Germany. And you'll see that we're just doing quick pours of wine, just short, out, um, short, short pours all together. Mm -hmm. um, because we want to taste them, we want to get a good feel of them, and then we want to be able to keep moving through. Yeah, well, See, take it away. I feel like that's the thing too about when you're in, um, when you're in a tasting, when you're and you're in this like big room and all of these wines, just take little sips, you know, mm -hmm. and so that you can go right back to the wine that you really like. Yeah. So you're like not too full or. <laughs> um, oh man, I love this wine so much. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh! So getting it right in. Um, the glass right now. So this is a Von Buhl coming from the Faltz region of Germany. Uh, it's a little different than the Mosel and then it's a lot warmer. And stylistically, they make Rieslings that are, for the most part, on on the drier side than it would be with residual sugar in the Mosel. Um, and I love it so much because when I think about I think about minerality. This is like a wine that like speaks to me here. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, the fruit is really like limey, really like lemony. But then there's this like slate background. And when I talk yeah. about minerality, it's just like things that are not fruit. You're like, okay, I got the lime, mm -hmm. I got the lemon, but there's something else there. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about when I'm thinking about minerality. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and it keeps pulling you back in, right? Because oh. you're trying to identify it. A lot of times, it's harder to say this is what granite tastes like, or slate, yes. or chalk, yes. or sand. And kind of identifying those qualities in white. Okay. But just sort of like, just just sort of like in general, saying like this smells or tastes minerally. Yeah. Right? Stay there. Stay Do there. Do some research after. Come back. The idea of us having having curiosity about where wines come from is what keeps us engaged and interested. Like, why does this smell and taste like yes. this? That's geeky to us. That's exciting, right? That's information we translate to bring to the table so we can say, this is the difference between one from the faults rather than one from the Mosul, and then smaller, more individual vineyards within them. Uh, Erica yeah. And, yeah. and Nelly, a few questions about a rubbery smell. Like, what's up with rubber? Yeah. Is it cool or not? Is this, is, is it mean it's messed up? Or are we like totally geeking out on, on, on that smell? What's the story of that? Don't it's know. cool. Yeah, it's so cool. a rubbery smell is so indicative of Riesling. Yeah. Um, it's something that you expect to have in Riesling. And it's interesting because when you eat foods from this region, the f the foods from there cancel out this like rubbery kind of lingering taste. It's, yeah. it's amazing, um, and I and I I kind of like it. I think you grow to yeah. like it, and I think um, especially rieslings with age, you get a lot more of this like, oh, yeah. rubbery smell. Yeah, right. You know? One of our things and as Psalms, uh, we whenever we Gasoline. go to parties, yeah, yeah, we want like that. <laughs> We want to bring something cool to a party. We want to impress people. Ugh. But every time like you try to do that, it always like, like no matter how much money you spend, no. it's not like it's not about that. Maybe the hunt then usually for us is find an old German Riesling that may have not cost a whole lot to begin with, and then over time it shows that you've cared about the wine. You've had like this intention to open it up twenty years down the road. Um, the sweeter they are when while they're young. That's a preservative in wine, so it'll help them age. And now when you get sort of like that that rubber or that petrol, that sort of like known in wine, you'll see it as, as Riesling 
evolves, right? Yes. And that makes it more beautiful. That becomes like one of those like wines that you do in a big tasting that you remember for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the gasoline esque, the petrol yeah. is mostly just on the nose. On the yeah. palate, it's just like all fresh as can all I right. I'm let's, gonna drink. Yeah, let's drink it, let's drink it. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. It's so different in body mm. than the Feluga, right? Yeah. Where the Feluga was like rich and sort of mouth coating, this is like piercing. Yeah. It's like just your whole palate is like completely cleared. Yeah, you, you almost smelled like it was going to be sweet. Yeah. Almost an idea of like, yeah. again, this like candied lime, maybe a sugary quality of, of what that looked like, really maybe some, some riper fruit qualities. Mm -hmm. And then on the palate, the moment you swallow it, it is like fighting acidity is just like stripping it dry right all the way through yeah have it have it with some cheese i think <laughs> this is the perfect thing i had some cheese earlier and that brought out like a little bit of a peachiness to it right mm -hmm. i felt like a fruitiness right when i had that and a lot of times like when you get older or cheese but with a little bit of age to it it'll have like the saline quality maybe yes, like buried like like, like diamonds salt of salt yeah. yeah and then they just pop and that's awesome Ooh. And don't be, you know, like with Riesling, I mean, people people sort of like stay away from that um, because they don't want something sweet. You know, you'll, there, there are certain ways to navigate a wine shelf. Uh, a lot of times wine from the faults may be on that drier side. Other markers will tell you that they're, that they're dry, like Trocken will mean yeah. that they're dry. Um, so, so look for those clues. And if you ever sort of like have any questions, ask somebody that's in the wine department. They'll, they'll show you just something that's dry, lean, minerally, and just absolutely delicious. Yeah, like this I mean, is just, incredible. Just like in Seattle, like everyone working in mm. every wine department in any shop in Seattle is like bursting to talk to you. Yeah, They're like, yeah. oh, I've studied, oh, I've studied this for so long and I can't wait to talk to you about it, you know? And so well, just like, don't be intimidated. Just be like, I had a wine that was like this. Mm. Can you find me a wine that's like this? Yeah. So, well, tell us about this winery. Yeah, um, so Von Buhl, there, oh my gosh, so many generations. This actually, their original crest was like made by a famous like um, artist. It was commissioned in like 1887. I mean, they're an old winery. They definitely, uh, they so, so uh, they have their own vines. Uh, not this wine in particular, but some of their wines are made by their own vines. This is a Negociant one. Uh, it's just, it's amazing that we can get this kind of quality yeah. of wine, you know, like all the way, I mean, here in Washington, but yeah. it's really cool to know because all of the Washington wines are like, you know, 20 years, the wineries are like oldest are like 20 years old or yeah. 30 years old. And this is just, it's incredible. Yeah. You know, like yeah. when you think about wines all together, wines from Europe versus the wines from the United States, um, we celebrate old vines here. Yeah. Uh, when you go to Europe in a place like this, their oldest vines are like 40 years old, 50 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can get, you know, like generations deep where they're yeah. even like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And to put something like that in a bottle at a reasonable price is pretty incredible, right? Um, maybe naturally that we sort of like, as Psalms, find those stories to to help us like like love and engage with the wine. Um, and then we sort of discover those things as we start to meet with people, taste more and then travel. I think this is a good example of reasoning that's dry that continues to like pull us in and show us something new. Right? I know. I love it. Yeah, I so do I. I I I'm glad that you chose all of these. I mean we chose these like really chuggable ones. <laughs> mm. I just yeah. You know, um let's see, like you know, I, I had this idea of like like what you what you bring to a wine party or some one of the questions that so I wanted to, to sort of like topics that I wanted to bring up was what wines do you bring to a wine party and what that should look like? Um, you, it doesn't have to be expensive. No. Be thoughtful in what you bring, right? Have some background information. Do a little bit of work so you're not just jumping to, the, uh, to a retailer just before you go to a party. But um, have an idea of what you want that to be. Champagne's an easy one to bring. Uh, white wines are actually like really cool and fun to have and actually something that helps to refresh the palate as you go along. And then when you go for red wines, do something where, maybe it's where you're from, maybe it's something that represents a place that you've traveled, a story that you'd like to share. Uh, and, you know, I would say like, be, be in bounds. Have, have, have limits to yourself to say like, I don't have to spend a whole lot of money in it, but I just want it to be good. And I want people to like, I want, I want to share this with people. So, 
more than the yes. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in, us here, right? I mean, as some ways, we want to to have get you the right bottle of wine, not necessarily the most expensive. Never really the most expensive, but no. But it has to be. We're trying to find the right fit for yeah. 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 And always bring the bottle that you want to drink yourself. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You want to be like, oh man, yeah. I really want to drink that so yeah. bad. Or yeah, like, pop it when you I get there. Taste it. Open it up. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna like they're gonna grab the bottle, say thank you so much, shove it and in their cellar, like, no, never no, to no, be no, seen no. again. No, that's the trick. Okay, <laughs> that's the trick. You yeah. you show up to a party, immediately pop your bottle. Yeah. Unless no, you want no that question. to be a gift. Unless it's a um, gift, you if it's a gift, you put a ribbon on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because I don't yeah. want to be at a party and be like, I bought, I bought that, yeah. and I wanted to taste it. That's true. You never quite know if that's like, am I supposed to have a lot of this or just open no. it? So it's it is gift. cool if you just were like, let's drink it right now. I really mm -hmm. want you to taste this. You I really, pull, you know you pull I mean? the wine like, key right out of your you pocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're following along at home, I'm saying go for two thirds of the bottle, a little in each glass, so you can come back to it later. I want to keep coming back to a wine like this where it's going to refresh in my palate. Or a wine like the Chablis um, <laughs> that we'll keep coming back to, just so that we have markers and sort of like this reference point on what wine is. The Chablis, you know, wines that can be a little cheesy, high in acid, neutral, really no oak to it. We're gonna move on to the next wine. This is Chardonnay from France. Oh this God. is from, uh, this is the Baptiste Nauron Cote Lyonnais. And this wine itself uh, isn't from a, na a region where you would naturally find Chardonnay, but this is tucked between. Burgundy to the north, and then the Rhone Valley to the south. Mm -hmm. So just south of Lyon, right? What Lyon would represent is really the uh, this vibrant, big metropolitan city that's full of life, um, youth, and then the historic sort of like gastronomic center of all of France, right? And then if you start to like go north and you find Burgundy and you have really only two grapes, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and as you travel towards the south where it's warmer, you'll find sort of like those richer, um, meatier, white and red wines all together, right? This one here is from a small place called Cotu Lyonnais. Um, unlike American or, or wines from, the, from around the world, European wines usually tell you what, where they're from instead of what the grape is on the label. So you'll need to do some digging or you'll need to do, or you'll need to ask some questions. Um, but for a wine like this, um, that's where it delivers where you see value. It's not something that jumps off the shelf naturally um, that says Chardonnay from Napa or wherever it may be, where it sort of like triggers a lot of like these, these dollar signs. Go to do a little bit of homework and find something that sort of like fits, fits a range. or have like, like curiosity to find something new. I think that's like the fun part too. Because you're yeah. like, I love Oof. Chardonnay, and I do love Chardonnay. I love Chardonnay. But it's like, if you go to Chablis or if you go to these like big name places, you'll that also comes with like a price tag of that recognition, you right. know. And so when you find something, you're like, whoa, this is Chardonnay, but from where? Yeah. From what? That's really cool, and it's like it's fun to kind of experiment, yeah. you know. All right, when I put it in the glass, and as I'm swirling it, I'm looking at it, I notice uh, immediately a bit more of a golden color to it. Maybe, um, you know, this one here was chilled, so you start to see that frost on the glass, but through it, you see a little bit of that sort of like, um, that peach skin, maybe, you know, like a touch of that gold, gold. bordering a little bit of brass. Um, that, that tells me either uh, it's got a little bit of oak, or then that it's got some age on it. Yeah. In this case, it's not the age, it's, it's the oak. Uh, I did a little more research. This only sees really old oak barrels, um, but but that's maybe not the biggest quality here. It's a little hazy, right? So a winery like this is doing wines where they're uh, certified organic, they're, they're on a scale of doing things r the right way, being careful in the vineyards, low intervention altogether, low on sulfites and sulfur in the winemaking process. Um, so they're trying to be really healthy in what they're trying to do. Well, careful, well, intentional. All those things make sense. Uh, when you finally get it in a bottle, uh, it's something that does, doesn't really have a shelf life to it, but you want to drink it sooner rather than later. And the benefits from that are a wine like this. Lively, refreshing, exciting, and just like easy to drink. So on the nose, what I get is sort of more now of that tropical fruit, a little bit of pineapple, some kiwi, um, I get some golden apple to it, and then behind that, I get more of that salinity. That sort of salinity, reminds me of this yeah. like, limestone chalkiness. Yeah. I get like an apricot-y, 
right at the top, like yeah. a like a preserved apricot, you know? That no, was like so good. Skin. Oh. Ugh. I, you know, I don't get any of that oak treatment to it or oak quality. I know that's being used in like five-year-old oak barrels, yeah. but I think what they're saying is that I want very little of that oak to influence the yeah. wine, but soften the edges of it. Mm. So now I want, now I'm curious. Now I want to taste it. Right. You talk about like softening the edges too. Like the Von Buhl definitely didn't mm. see like oak in the same way, you know, that this yeah. has. And so like that Von Buhl was like bracing, right? Just yeah. like your palate was like completely cleared. And right. in this, and we talk about softening, it's that roundness, yeah. you know? How different is that so on the palate, different. right? Like one's electricity. When you finish it, it's like And then the other. And you're done. Like, yeah, <laughs> gotta go, yeah. yeah. No saliva on your palate, you're done, yeah. it's so dry. And then you go to something like this, it's like inviting for something else. Oh, yeah. So go for it. I think this is a, a place where you start to introduce something with a little more fat to it. The sausage will do that, so meat do will it. do that, cheese will do, do that. It. Yeah, get in there. Yeah, and, and that's where you start to see this, this um, combination of something where you're having food, now you're going into something mm. a little richer for a wine that can take it. Not that the Furlano or the Riesling couldn't do it, but you start to see this natural sort of like weight behind something that could carry a little bit of oak and then the benefits of that now, where it can, it can take uh, food with a little bit of either spice or a little bit of a little more fat. Something salty, Ooh. yeah. All right. Ooh. What else do you What else do you get? I love this. Oh man, this is so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is Chardonnay, right? This is like this is um, Baptiste Naron from Cote Lyonnaise, and this is like the uh, Chardonnay from from different a different growing region, which would you normally find, right? You think of of Burgundy, and then more more generally, when you start to think of New World wines, like wines out of the coast or like like. California or and then Oregon will do, they'll do fantastic Chardonnays there too. Washington State, something that has a little bit more tropical notes to it as well. But this one here from Cote Lyonnaise, an appellation that's sort of like outside of the way, young winemaker that's trying something new. Um, Puy Avan is sort of saying that's the wine wells. It's a, it's a small sort of like vineyard that they're just making a few hundred cases of Chardonnay and it's absolutely delicious. And sort of like off the main radar of what Burgundy could be like or, or wines that you'll find other places, but it delivers, right? Be curious about this. Um, and I think you'll find some real gems there. Yeah. yeah. I think it's uh, so good. You know, like when we keep, like we'll keep going and we'll keep drinking and sort of we have this like one inside tip. So, so Erica, why don't you share with one of, a, one of your um, sommelier secrets with us? Okay, well the Kayla's wine team is shrouded in secret mostly, but there's, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well one thing, one thing that you, we learn when you first come onto the team is, um, Never be the first person to taste and never be the last person to taste. Because, okay, so you know, Nelly was like, oh, you know, only pour out two thirds of your bottle, right? Of that we, that for the people that are at home. It's because towards the end, Nelly's really smart. He always saves a little because that last taste after you've tasted everything else is like, oh, it's just like so incredible mm. for your palate. You're like, yeah. You know, after you've tasted all these wines, and then you're like, except this one was my favorite. You mm -hmm. go back to it after your palate's already been on a journey. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like transcendent, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a confirmation of flavors. It's something that reminds you, again, or reaffirms everything that you said, like why you enjoy this wine. Come back to the wines that you really enjoy. All the other wines, it maybe somebody else really digs that and, and, and let them finish it. But wines that you want, um, stick with it. Right, we save a little something Always. for each. When you say don't be the last one to sip it, yeah. don't be the last. Hey, make sure everybody Always has a chance to taste. See this, <laughs> see this like tiny little bit that you have. If you're at a wine tasting, keep just this much in your glass. Okay, this is a pro tip because <laughs> I can't handle my liquor as well as Nelly can. So you keep this much in your glass, and so when someone tries to pour you more wine, you say, "Oh, I'm still working on this one, man. Yeah, I'm yeah, so sorry. sorry, you know." And then, and someone brings over a bottle of wine that you really want to drink, you're like. Down the hatch, here you go, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's, it's like, like this. Yeah. Oh, what are you drinking? Oh, cool, hey, you want some of this? Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, all right, here we go. <laughs> mm, yeah, 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 yeah. 
That's... Literally one of the best tricks you can learn from a song yeah. right, is that right there. Like, imagine them sure bringing this to you, like, hey, you want some of this? You're like, oh, so no, got this. oh, sorry, still I still have it. this. Still working on it. Sorry about that. I'm still working on it. I'm so sorry. But maybe once I'm done with this. Yeah. I yeah. think that's why Jason the... didn't finish his first class. <laughs> <laughs> still oh, yeah. working on it. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, it's oh. empty. Oh, come on now. I'm going to transition to red now. Nelly. Yeah. What do you, especially for our friends at home yeah. that are, you know, just starting out in wine, or maybe they're just not Ooh. as, like, is it good? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe just not as confident. Like, it's wine is intimidating. What is, yeah. what is like, the best way to get started? I would say um, find, you know, after, after you've, um, you're, you'll spend time exploring wines. You're, you'll go through and drink through a lot of different wines that may not be what you're looking for um, but f a single into a grape or a region that you really enjoy in this case we we're just talking about a lot of things Grenache for me too was an early love and an easy one oh, so something easy. that like yeah you know chat I I don't know how to speak French but Chateauneuf de Pop I'll tell you it was like <laughs> one of the easiest French words and regions that I learned to say and um, it made me feel like I was um, like with it a little bit. Like I can oh. say shut enough to pop. Yeah, shut enough to pop mm -hmm. all day long. <laughs> and but but you know what? Um that got me really curious to know what that meant. Whether it was the word itself, shut enough to pop, or then what went into the blend, right? A Grenache blend with maybe up to 13 different grapes. Um a place in France which reminded me a little bit of home where it's hot, warm and sort of like filled with like tons of culture. And then you sort of like dig into it a little more and you say Grenache then can be grown on rocks, which is done from an ancient riverbed uh, that they called Galais. And then something like that just keeps to build on the foundation of a wine or a grape that I really enjoyed. Right. So I stuck with it. And still to this day, Grenache and Chateauneuf de Pop is something that I continue to go and gravitate towards and then and then branch from and grow from um, a lot of times. Uh, a wine being intimidating, you should stay with with wines that sort of like, like you really enjoy. In this case, Grenache. Explore it a little more. Find where it's grown around the world and try those different regions. Yeah. Go to a retailer. Stick with them, and then and then like continue to build that palate. Have somebody alongside you, an early or a tasting group, a group of friends that want to learn and explore the same way you want to do, and then do that. Stay with it. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of questions around just like hey, where the best place to shop is. Do you guys have a, a, yes. I mean, a, a, a yes, yeah. you're standing in our cellar. Outside of this, when you're it's like a weekend, you find yourself with nothing. Yeah. Like, oh, I gotta get out there. Do you just have like a go to spot? Some like You know, people that I call um a lot on rely a lot on, you know, McCarthy and Shearing, Dan up here around the corner is really somebody good. that's easy to sort of like What up, uh, Dan? Uh, uh, yeah, somebody you trust. He's been in the, the business for over 40 years. He's so great. Yeah, he and Jay, Dan and Jay, are, are uh, landmarks in the wine business. And then you think of like Champion Wine Cellars, who's Aaron. transitioned from Emil down in the lower part of Queen Anne now to Erin and her team. Um, and they are, they're incredible. I think they're like relevant. I think they're super I'm hip. Sorry. And, the, and like sort of like get what we're drinking. They have a shelf. They have shelves filled with things that are interesting. They taste a lot of wines and they'll lead you in the right direction. Yeah. Otherwise, there's tons of other wine shops and retail markets that you can go to. Find something off the I shelf. I Left Bank. I like, I like if you like more natural wines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, these places where you can go into now, like Left Bank, it, where you can sample some of these wines and then buy something off the shelf as a retail That's item, cool. take it home. And so, yeah. 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 Well, Big Cat, this is your yeah. wine. Why don't you take us away and tell us what uh, we've got here? So, this is the uh, Angelique Leon Chinons. This is Cabernet Franc coming from the Loire Valley. Uh, so it's 100% Cabernet Franc. And for those of you who don't drink Cabernet Franc, but you're like, Cabernet, I've heard of that. So Cabernet Franc, as a grape, it's kind of, it's similar to Cabernet Sauvignon in flavor in that it has all these like, beautiful sort of green notes mm -hmm. to it. Um, but it has a, a more like lifted fruit quality. So it's more sort of like raspberry, jammy, it's like touching on blackberry and it's nowhere near as heavy. So it's really interesting that we get to taste this and then down the road we're gonna taste the PLA. Cause yeah. they're like, I mean distant, distant cousins, but <laughs> <laughs> they're cousins. Um, but in style, this is just a lighter uh, wine altogether. And on the yeah. nose, 
I mean, you're getting that, that green, like, you yeah, know, that like, Yeah, that bell pepper, and it's sort of like, like, a garden, a fresh garden herbs. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And then I get yes. that, that, like, crushed red fruit, you know, that raspberry, that wild berry, early season sort of, like, form. Yeah. Yeah. You know that, like, just open the Tostitos salsa smell? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like. Now we're talking. That's <laughs> now we're getting official. <laughs> you let off with chugging, mm, and now we're just free no. on. Salsa. No, I, am I love it. The classy one. Like the yeah. Yeah. wine team. Yeah, definitely. You are definitely the classy one. <laughs> you know, like, and when when I go through wine, I, I don't spend a whole lot of time. I'm doing all three things. I am like swirling the wine to to see what legs look like. I'm trying to pick up information as far as like staining of the tears. I'm looking for quality in the gradient of color from the yeah. core to the rim. I may give me an indication of age or it can be an indication just of of the grape in itself Absolutely. through oxidation. And then I'm always smelling. Always right? smelling. I'm all, you know me, I'm like smell wine forever because that changes and evolves. Yeah. When you get on the palate, it gives you tactile information to to talk about acidity, tannin, other fruit qualities, uh, alcohol, etc. But when you smell it, that will evolve so much faster than so the palate will. Um, so that's me. And then when I finally get the time to sip on it, that's that's like 30 seconds down the road. I yeah, let's see. I, I mean, Nelson has this also. Nelson's such a huge proponent on like the progression of a wine itself, especially <clears throat> during the night. Like we would work service upstairs and we would taste a wine and you'd be like, oh, it smells like this now. And then like an hour later, yeah. you'd be like, oh, it smells like this now. And that's like, it's so exciting, kind of like the journey of like the way that these wines evolve, not just like in the bottle in your cellar for 30 years, but yeah. in your glass, you know? Yeah. You know, like when I, when we when we go through here and we talk about like what tears look like, uh -huh. you know, we talk about like, um, it's, it's an early sort of like wine term that you get out of a tasting room or in an early wine like class. That's what everyone wants to talk about. Like, yeah, oh, like, yeah. Well, well you know, yeah, like, yeah. oh, look at the legs on that what one. Is it, hey, what does it really mean? Yeah, you know, it's it's sort of an idea of then um, the level of, of uh, saturation that a grape can bring. Uh, talks about quality, uh, not so much quality, but the, the uh, idea of sugar or alcohol in a grape, right? That's, that's what's sort of like what you see in legs as it sort of trickles down the glass. The more, um, color you see coming down on them really really associates itself to like the level of alcohol and glycerol there is in a wine and then um, the second part of it will be as far, uh, how far apart they are you think of molasses and honey as slow as they drip down the glass you're feeling like something that's uh, dense in sugar rather than something that's a little lighter you don't see it a whole lot in white wines but those can you, can you tell by faster. looking like those tears so they're telling you about sugar or alcohol most of these wines are dry right mm -hmm. so not a lot yeah. of sugar but are you are you guys at all making a judgment call when you see those or are you more just swirling and having a good time like what's What's the, is this a party trick or is this just no, sort of like no, a real well, geeked out I expect all red something. wines to be dry. And when I'm swirling and I'm seeing the tears, I, I'm almost looking at sort of like what it means to be towards the vintage, whether it's a, a more saturated, a darker, a riper year. We're talking about alcohol, varying degrees of alcohol, whether it be one or half a degree can be a, be a huge factor in what the vintage was like. Um, in itself and talking about how warm those days are or mm -hmm. in the winemaking technique and how much they're extracting from the grape yeah. uh, and other times it can be a little bit of like like maybe I'm trying to get away with something by adding something to it and in something like this where you see it it's it's a little more natural you look at it it's softer when it's coming down the sh it's it's a light sort of like a pink tone with hints of red to it just like um, like a, like one perfect drop at a time that sort of coats the glass. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? All right, what do you, what else do you get? Uh, what, what can you tell me about um, just the region in itself? Before yeah, we so on? this is, uh, so Chinon is very classic Cabernet Franc. So if you're like, I want to get into, Ca I love this wine. I want to get into Cabernet Franc. Just Google Chinon, go to your yeah. local wine shop and say, I want to taste more Chinon. Um, and this is oh, this is like a, such a perfect example because mm -hmm. it's like light yeah. and like kind of bouncy in that same way. Yeah. Um, I think I think what you're saying is right too about the legs and the importance of um, making sure that 
what you think the wine is going to taste like or feel like is exactly in the glass the way that it is in your yeah. mouth. I kind of like, I feel like that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Yeah, when oh, I I'm digging this you know? wine. Go with like this, with some of the meat or cheese <sighs> and olives. All of it works. I know. This kind of reminds me of fall, <sighs> right? Sort of that, that oh crushed red fruit, a <sighs> little Ramble. earthy. Yeah. And, um, you know, we talked about early on about keeping your wines in the refrigerator and pulling them out 15 minutes ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Bring up, you brought up the white and the red. We're in the cellar here. It's 58 degrees. This is my office. I love this place. So we probably spend more time here. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> than guys, anywhere guys, else. I want to tell you. Are you saying that it's a good thing or a bad thing? I just like <laughs> live here and yeah. we have like, I mean, obviously I, I know these like, I know the cellar so much, but just letting you know, um, I'm actually on a step stool and I'm on, <laughs> I, do, it's very difficult for me to get to the top of and count all of these, but, um, but I love it down here Yeah. and I love, and it is cold, but I'm yeah. like, what's just really funny is cause you and I, like we have island blood and we're like, oh, it's like 58 degrees. Oh, it's yeah. like chilly. <laughs> yeah. We're here with hoodies doing inventory hours and hours at a time. Um, but it's we know, Paul, but. yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> The rest of the team is just like, we are, we are like in the cellar with almost 20,000 bottles. And we, like, if you just called out a wine and then. someone orders it on the floor, believe it or not, you know how geeked out we are? We know exactly what bin it is, how many we have left, where it is Who'd in the stack. What you do with your eyes closed? Do you think I, you it's do so it? silly, huh? Oh, yeah, like, it's really dumb. But we, like, pride ourselves in that. If there are yes. six bottles in that bin, yes. we are like, we know the That's exact like, steps. We want to be efficient. That like gets us excited. That's also like the thing that like we like argue about. Like we'll be upstairs on the floor and someone's like, hey, I'm trying to sell a bottle of PLA or whatever. And one of us is like, there's only two in bin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I just moved it. It's yeah, like yeah, closer yeah. to Burgundy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> And we're gonna go to the next wine, you know, and we talked about sort of like early on about wine temperatures and getting back on that same that mm -hmm. idea of it. Um, we like, I, you know, 58 degrees is a great way to store your wine at home. And um, and that's what the cellar is set at. We keep white and white burgundy here and we'll serve them at cellar temperature yeah. and reds. Mm -hmm. White burgundy and reds at cellar temperature. Everything else will be chilled a lot cooler. Champagne cooler, uh, American or domestic white wines colder, uh, but reds from the cellar, 58 degrees is a great starting point. Uh, now you'll get into now you'll get into the reds here where they have a little bit of a, a, a chill to them or should have. What that'll do is just like uh, like um, like like wake your palate up just a little more each time. That'll be fun. I feel okay. like also it preserves the esters in a way so that like as the wine is warming up and you're yeah. warming up to the wine, you know, it the yeah. kind of like the scent molecules just start to like liven up with you. Yeah. You know, and you can smell their evolution in this like really gorgeous way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like smell this wine. Now this wine is different, right? This is funky. <laughs> I love it. Give me some funky music. We, Jason, got the we need some funk. Bring we need some. Ask for some Bruno Mars early. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I missed. I in our normal jobs, we get to listen to Jason all the time. Yeah. And it was like, you know, what's missing in this restaurant? Because it's kind of been a little oh, slower, a little quieter yeah. these last know, seven so months. Quiet. It's just like the the background sound, soundtrack of, of Jason Lux. Oh it's yeah. Like, you just need him. You need him oh, yeah. for oh, the day to move. What you know? a stud. So, what a stud. I'm like. I think Jason needs to be um, in the cellar more often. Yeah, right? And I, I just really would love thing. to have a glass and drink some wine with him. Have him at a dinner party and just to like <laughs> pick his brain a, a bit, you know? Yeah, well, some tip oh, number yeah, two. Yeah, we're talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, here's a wine that we talk, not just talked about just being chilled, but an older vintage. This is 2011 Rioja from Spain. And this blend is a blend of, let's see, I'm going to read from the bottle. Tempranillo, Garnacha, Graciano, Manzuelo, uh, and it's an estate wine. So it's a winery that's been around for 143 years and established in 1877. Um, they're traditional. When you smell a wine like this in its Rioja, that's the idea of crushed red earth uh, and fruit with American oak. 
and Kyle Johnson, like our service director here, did a great example of what it looked like to have um, Rioja, after traveling there once, said he got like this um, um, uh, array of fruits that he, that he associated with. So it was strawberries, cranberries, fresh cherries, um, and he put a little bit of vanilla, um, some dill, uh, coconut, dill. and then he used a, a, a rock from our parking lot and he crushed it up, right? Remember that, all those flavors and the idea of it is incredible. That's what this wine smells like. You know, it's got a little bit of age on it, but you would ask, would I decant it? No, it's a little bit more delicate than that. So the idea to decant the wine for age or then um, for sediment, uh, I would say check it. We check every bottle. If we pull it up from the cellar, we have every bottle coming up to the wine station on its side this way until we get to a spotlight in the cellar. And it'll look just like this. There's one light in, yeah, our, in, one in light. the wine station that we always look for. And I will check it. If it doesn't have any wines, uh, sediment, it's ready to go. I'm ready to serve it. Mm -hmm. If it does, We'll keep it up in an angle and we'll wait for it to settle. So you're talking yeah, about... Oh, Sorry. go ahead. A lot of people just store their wines in, in different and, and that is something unusual about this cellar, kind of a, a thing that, that we all inherited was this idea that you don't have to store it down because then the sediment ends up down by the cork. Right. And it ends don't up being like a snow globe Yeah. when you when you tip it up, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Plan for it, right? Plan to like, don't use... We don't use aerators here, but we plan on... on on uh, the anticipation of it. So a couple so, of questions around aerators. Like, do they work? Are they cool? Are, are this just like a hoax? Like, what's up with aerating they, wine? They can work. Um, they can, you can, you can, you can, you can advance wine faster um, these days than you could have ever. And those inventions sort of are a little gimmicky. I will but, say, yeah, I'll yeah. say that double decanting is more, feels better to me than buying an aerator. Mm -hmm. Double decanting is like the process of moving a wine from a bottle into a decanter yeah. and then from the decanter into the bottle yeah. or vice versa as many times as it's to open up. Yeah. If that makes any, um, that makes any sense, I feel like. Right, the gonna... exchange of oxygen, yes. right, from one vessel to the next and then brought back over yeah. is agitation, the, right? Agitation and then like the surface area of the wine yeah. is exposed to so much more oxygen yeah. and that helps and I, you would only use that. You wouldn't do it for a wine that's this old. Right. You would only do it for a wine that's like much younger, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know, like as we keep, as we sort of like keep going with that, you want to like what's sexier than like having like plans for getting a bottle ready for when it should be drank? You know, like I got a bottle of white in the fridge, popped it open. We're doing that while we're cooking. We'll have that as appetizers. But the bottle of red, I popped at the same time I did as the, the white and I decanted it, so it'll be ready for us. All right, so let's let's do like what this wine smells like and tastes like, and I'll take you through it pretty quickly. But I love the nose. I talked a little bit about that brambly red fruit, that earthiness, that dustiness, the coconut, the dill. Oh, and I, I beat it. you to it. I already drank some. I haven't drank some. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Softer on the palate. Mm. I don't get a whole lot of tannin, but dusty, earthy, earthy rustic is are some of the things that I get from it. And it's a wine sort of like that I pick up, smell, taste, and say like, like I want to have some food with this too. Like oh, sorry. beautifully Keep done roast that. chicken, um, some some roasted vegetables, something that's softer, something that's a little lighter. Softer. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love roast chicken with this. Mm. I love the texture of it. Oh my gosh, it's so special to taste this wine next to, you know, next yeah. to the Chinon, next to the PLA, because the mouthfeel. So when people talk about tannin. It's a lot of that, like the grittiness that's on your tongue, right? Yeah. And there's just a little bit of grit here, yeah. right? And it's so, when you put tannin and tannin together, so like so something like chicken or something like steak, those have tannin in it. You put them together and they just like mm. cancel each other out. It's great. Mm. Okay, we're gonna okay, go to okay. the next one. Couple, go to the next one, but can also, I would you mind? A couple of folks just would love to see labels. Can you just, about yeah. by your left arm, maybe just kind of line them all up there? We'll get the camera crew to just kind of aim at them. Hooray! You know, it would be super cool. This no, one. in order. Yeah, <laughs> Chef. Line them up, Erica. You gotta keep them straight. <laughs> this, this last one, you know, we talked about like having a dinner party and all that. And, and we um, sort of like go through like all the pressures of hosting, mm. you know, like. I have the benefit of 
of like, like being here and having glassware available to me and, and things that I bring home. But believe me, not all of them are the same. You know, if don't don't feel the pressure of hosting people and having to have the needing to have the same glassware at home. We give you two glasses. Add that to the collection. When you have people at home and you have a huge party, it's all right to have different stems in the house. Oh yeah. Use whatever you have. Oh yeah. So we brought some wine glasses from home that we're gonna use. Yeah, because that's what we do. Okay. And you know what? You'll never lose track of them for sure. when you have it at home. So. <laughs> this is my wine glass. Uh, it says, um, Shit's about to It's about to get fancy. <laughs> I love that you brought it's, that glass it's out. About it's about to get fancy. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. So, so the glasses that Nelly and I are drinking out of, they're called Zaltos, and it's the glass that Canless Restaurant uses. Like, all the guests get to use it. Yeah. Um, but I don't have a, like... What do you got? I don't have a fancy, like, glass cleaner, and I don't have back servers to Ooh. polish. So this is what I use at home. Yeah. What I really like to use. Yeah. Um, this is reindeer. Yeah. So these are, uh, so this is sake akishika. Nice. Um, it's used, sorry, this way. Sake akishika. Um, it used to have delicious sake in it and it was a uh, candle holder for a moment, but now I drink all of my wine out of it. Yeah, yeah, because... perfect. <laughs> Very Euro of you. But the thing is, to be honest, um, if I knock it over, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. You are gonna break wine glasses at home. <laughs> Let's be real. It will happen. It's almost that's, like everyone should take a wine glass and just break it right now. That's just to right. get over yeah. the whole wine you, glass. Oh Believe me. But since all we the got, excuses come out. Since we got the Zaltas and the yeah. wine, wine team, every single... Zaltas are notoriously like so delicate and easy to break. Um, if I I can hear a glass break somewhere in the restaurant, I'm like, it's a white. It was a Zalto yeah. white. Yeah. Uh, it was a Zalto Pinot. I knew yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> like just by the sound of the breakage. So wow. All right, so uh, the last bottle of wine. Would... Oh, let's go in the lineup here. I'm gonna put it forward. This is Pile. This is from Washington State. A newer winery uh, in the last few years. Family owned. Snohomish, tell, Snohomish. tell us about it. Yeah, family home, Snohomish. And for those of you at home, I guess everyone at home is in Washington that's drinking this right yeah. now, but uh, I love my Washington wines. Like I love Washington yeah. Cab. I love I love a good blend and I, I'm so yeah. proud of the wines that we're making here. Don't you think? Yeah. I think, um, I It's mean, cool, like the, one of the up and coming wineries. Yes. It's something that we've used a few times and even served out at the Crab Shack. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. wine that I really enjoy and believe in. Great, great quality um, and something that's well balanced and I think something that delivers, something to be on the lookout for. Oh my yeah. gosh. What do you got? So on the nose, uh, so the fruit here is so much darker, so much deeper, right? And you remember that Rioja, even the Chinon, those like light, like uh, raspberry, red cherry flavors. This is like, this smells like Barcelona. blackberry, yeah. black cherry. It's dark, really, really dark yeah. fruit. And on the palate too, it's just Ooh, so yummy. much bigger yeah. and riper and like juicier. Like, yeah. Do you love it in oh. your fancy glass? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, you know what I like about it? It's got this great texture. I yes. keep coming back to that. Whether it's something you have with food or something that reminds you of um, an extra tactile uh, piece of information that you get. Outside of tannin, outside of acidity, uh, alcohol gives you texture. And this one here, um, not just not just oak, but I also get this sort of like velvety quality that rounds yeah. off the edges. So it makes it inviting to go after one, one bite after another. So I want something hearty. I want something rich with this. I want steak. I want something meaty. I want something beefy. Oh, it's so good with this. And that's what really you get this. Cabernet. Yeah, the, yeah. And Nelly, so Kathleen here is saying, hey, I get violets and vanilla. There's a lot of yes. chat around just sort of what they're getting. And maybe just an encouraging word around at least the way that you've trained us all to taste, right. which is, yeah. reminds me of teaching my kids how to talk, which is just like spit it out. Like there's kind of no wrong answer here and you stick your nose in there and you're trying to like come up with the words. Right. How do you guys do that? How do you guys do describing? Is it is it awkward to say that? Yeah. Is it right or wrong? You know, the, 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 everyone on the team, um, I would say I've had a chance to like see uh, Erica 
every, everyone there, whether it's whether it's Emily, Elton, Paul, everyone sort of has this has are, are great writers and have great descriptors of what it looks like and tastes like. Um, so why don't you take it away? What do you have? What do you get out of the wine? And I get those those violets yes. and the, the dark I, red fruit. I love that. I yeah. think that's such an amazing way of seeing that. And that's, I love that that's so, f f you know, forward for you. Mm. Um, and I, I think that, you know, vanilla is such a great call on this. Just like, just kind of like melted milk chocolate too. And lavender, all of those notes are notes that I'm smelling too. I think that's excellent. And if you're yeah. trying to find a wine like this, you know, and they like, you know what, I really love the peel day. When you go to your wine shop or when you're like checking and you're looking, ask for something that has just just like a, you know, a moderate amount of oak, something that's just like a tiny bit richer, nothing like too overpowering because we're not, I mean, on your palate, it's not like stripping your your tongue in any way, you know? It's just like mm. soft and like supple like a, you know, like a blackberry cobbler, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like everything that you want. Yep. I to get that out of wine converted from grapes Fermented, aged in oak, bottled, takes years and years to do. Yeah. They can be, they, could, they, they are waiting for that moment for it to be open. And they're so proud for it to be on a table and to be served. If we can pull those flavors out of what was grown out of, out of Yakima, Red Mountain, Walla Walla, mm -hmm. that's our job as not just sommeliers, but I think the reward is ha having going into the glass and translating it just a little bit so people can enjoy it. This is one that I see the benefits of sort of like um, uh, a great touch in winemaking, understanding how to do it and how to balance it all together. Getting the most amount of fruit up on the nose, it's a youthful wine, right up front, and then and then softening on the palate. Something that you want to put in the cellar for a little while, continue to follow and track as the years go by. And something that you say to yourself, cool, I'm on the inside track, I know somebody that's an up and coming winery, follow it along. And then um, like for us, that's what we do for, for any of the wines that we follow. And then say like, cool, getting better, always improving. Always getting better, And yeah. you know, when you, when, you, when you follow a winery like that, you can understand vintages a little easier too. You understand what the vintage brings to it. You understand that the quality is the same as high as always been. And you understand the elevage or the way that they're leaving it in barrels for a certain amount of time. So those those uh, factors stay the same, the vintage changes. Yeah. And when you do that and you see that, that's beautiful. So that's where our wine sort of come, comes in. Now we got we got time for just for a couple of questions. Yeah. A lot of them have come through and I've, I've, you guys have covered so many of them, but um, Let's do if it. we can yes. just do a quick yes. like yes. shotgun on a couple of these things. Yeah. So um, one of them, just about faulty wines and cork and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, Erica, how would you describe for someone who's never done Who's never? It was like you stick your nose and there's this moment in the restaurant, right? And you're like, oh, oh yeah. I'm supposed to smell it. And, yeah. and what are they? What are they smelling for? Like, what's the telltale for just a goofy, faulty wine? Um, it smells like okay. So hold on. What's really important, first of all, is if you break the cork and there's like pieces of cork in your wine, it doesn't mean that the wine is corked. That's like the most important thing, mm -hmm. especially for older wines because those corks like can fall apart. I have made that mistake. Um, so just because there's pieces of cork in the wine doesn't mean that it's corked, but a corked wine is kind of a misnomer. It just means that, you know, it has this particular chemical that makes it smell like wet cardboard. It kind of smells really, really musty. And so like, for example, if this, if this POLA was corked, it's not, but if it was, instead of smelling fruit or anything, we'd smell either absolutely nothing <laughs> or a ton of wet cardboard mm -hmm. right and then thank and then nelly just a, quickly and i know we'll put this up on the class notes yeah. later but maybe just a couple resources uh, for those that want to learn more about wine uh, a favorite book or a favorite website like a go-to sort of what what are some resources that yeah wine uses? folly locally madeline has done a wonderful job Madeline's she's idea. she's an incredible author wine folly is incredible um, Kevin's Raleigh doing Windows of the World it was one of the first wine books that I've ever gotten. Kermit Lynch, Adventures on the Wine Route. Uh, killer, like not just killer books, but gives you an insight to Wine Bible. Um, uh, wine Bible, we can't remember, just, just like, just like um, quick and easy anecdotes to, to understand wine, love wine a little bit. 
enough information to get you started to pull you into it into that world where you can explore it a little more um when when i talked about uh kevin Raleigh's adventures in the wine it helped me be a better wine buyer and understanding you know what th what wine buying was like 30 years ago or meeting people 30 years ago kevin uh you know like um Oh. Windows on the World. Windows was like on the World. The most one of the most important books to have. Yeah. And Jancis. 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 Of course. Those are those of are course. sort of like reference books Just because like they're so guy, detailed. Yeah. Hugh Johnson, you know, Hugh those Johnson. those like books maps are <gasps> maps, um, great conversations with with uh, winemakers. Jasper um, Morris. Jasper Morris. You know, Raj and and Jordan have gone through and interviewed winemakers that we really enjoy. They're <sighs> They're super modern and of today. Um, if you want to, my, my favorite wine podcast would be like Levy Dalton. Yeah. And listening to him interview these people in real time is just like so yeah. incredible. I think that um, on the East Coast, James Sly is doing these amazing things, amazing maps, amazing content for children. Yeah. I, I love everything coming out of New York right now. Yeah. So, so, you know, like take this time, go back through it come back to the wines that you really enjoyed um, and, and spend some time with them. Explore them, see what you like. You know, one my, my, my psalm secret, and if I can just add one more thing before we wind down here, I really enjoy, uh, and we'll do it a lot, a Dick's Burger with like <laughs> good this Washington so Cabernet. True. I'm you so know, glad you brought this up. Different things, you know, like I like for for a cheeseburger, I want lamb burger. That's done by Coyote Vineyards. They do the best lamb burger in the state. But when I get something richer and something fuller body, like a deluxe or a special, deluxe. when I'm feeling naughty, you know what I mean? <laughs> Go with like a big <laughs> red wine. Nice. Your wine team is drinking all this amazing wine and like having leftover kilo soup. The truth yeah. is, you guys are <laughs> always eating cold Dick's burgers yeah. and fries and like pairing it yes. with Chardonnay it's and ice so and stuff. Dead. Yes. Serious. Which is a good reminder, by the way. Next yeah. week, we should just bring this up before we wrap up. It's all Not up. next week, but you're going to do a boxed wine and canned wine yeah. class. Oh, so, so that's coming up. And yes. then next week, uh, what are we doing? What do we have next week? We have... Um, Bread Lab. Bread Lab. Bread Lab. Bread Lab. Bread Lab. And then we have Canless Classics on Thursday. Yep. And Mr. Then, and Mrs. Uh, C, oh. Mark here. It's <laughs> um, so exciting. We got some kits available. Canless Classics. Get it. You know, it is like one of the kits, I, th I would say, um, that you'll be able to f not just follow along, but a podcast where you get the, the recipe for it and can make it time after time. Uh, and I think that is the real That's jewel. That's with mom and dad. It's going to be really jewel. cool. It's gonna yeah. Be so, and then aerobics, aerobics uh, after eight Wednesday morning with the Pacific Northwest Ballet. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah, community college just getting started here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad that you are too at home. <laughs> Stick with us. I'm glad um, to have this opportunity to like, to, to be around Erica and to share something that we're really deeply passionate about um, in a setting that like we have not done in seven months um Ooh, wow. so thank you for joining us i hope to see you again and many cheers yeah thank you have a cheers. great night